Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, we ask if our real memories can be uploaded to a cloud, why a Nobel Prize winner took to the hills, and what Star Wars geeks had to look forward to in New York. An exhibition in Istanbul considers what it means to be human in a post-internet era. We have an inside look at the place that inspired the only Portuguese language winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. And you don't have to go to a galaxy far, far away to get an early dose of Star Wars. Where does memory exist? For many these days, they are stored in clouds and iPhones. They create a reality where we exist virtually. And a new exhibition in Istanbul's Karako neighborhood is trying to discover what it means when your memories are split between your brain and a piece of machinery. Showcase the Sena Arslan checked it out. If we were to tell the story of human existence very, very briefly, it would be experience, make a memory, and repeat. But that process is getting ever more complicated, because science. It's addressed by American feminist scholar Donna Haraway, who published her Cyborg Manifesto in 1984. This influential essay explains how we can embrace technological gadgets to recraft our bodies, just like the three female artists spotlighted in this show. All of the artists have some sort of a photography background, so there is a part of documentation, which is the second part of the show is called Fluid Archives. So it's almost like trying to find a way like how we can uh, create a self-archive. And the artists featured in the show, Artificial Bloom, Fluid Archives, have done this in different ways. Austrian artist Christiane Peszczek used herself as a model in her most recent series. In this one here, she posed in the Dead Sea, covered completely in mud. It's a phone picture, and that's also this process that I said before, it's silver gelatine print, so, but it's only a phone picture, which usually if you make this big enlargement, mm. it will not work because you will see pixels. And that's why it's like an original photograph, so it's not a photographic print, it's really an enlargement of an analog negative. Fascinating. Christiana converts digitally manipulated photographs back into negative film. She turns pixels into a more traditional optical effect called grades. The process, she says, challenges the idea of history as a linear narrative. Turkish artist Zeynep Belarsberg is about self-documentation. She is using everyday objects like fake nails and memory cards. These hardware store materials were kind of provided the perfect um, uh, spatial uh, environment to show how I imagine them to be within my phone or in my computer. It's like our personal diary in a post-internet era. Meanwhile, French artist Luz Blanco is tackling memory and forgetting. See her work up close. There are layers of lines and dots, all separate. She's not interested in the online network issue in, in the same way as them. Uh, she's taking it a bit more negative maybe because she thinks that we are kind of missing some parts in, through this communication. So I think Zeynep and uh, Christiane, they are certainly embracing this, this reality and Luz is kind of discussing about like and kind of seeing it from a different point of view. Idemir thinks we're changing drastically in the digital era, and for good. In the end, this show was about like how we can see the positive like side of this, all of these elements, and and how we can create a different personality maybe through internet, and and it can be a positive thing too. But in this exhibition's idea of humanity, where is the history? Where is the culture? Well, maybe that notion of humanity is now obsolete or maybe what makes us us is more than storing memories on the cloud. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. A 
atop a hill amid the rugged volcanic terrain of the Canary Islands is a beacon of art and books. It's the home of Jose Saramago, Portugal's only Nobel Prize winner for literature. And after his death in 2010, his foundation opened up the building in Lanzarote. Here's our glimpse inside. One look at this view, and the only Portuguese writer to win a Nobel Prize decided to make the Canary Islands his home for the final 17 years of his life. Here's the kitchen where friends and many important names in politics and culture were invited in. Jose would sit here, Pilar Almodovar sat there, for instance. In the early 1990s, Portugal's conservative government blocked Jose Saramago's novel, The Gospel According to Jesus Christ, from receiving an international award. In protest, the author decided to leave Lisbon. Here in Lanzarote, Saramago opened his home to politicians and celebrities, and after he passed away in 2010, his home was turned into a museum, one where visitors are greeted with coffee and have a chance to glance into his home life. This is where I sit. We would chat, eat, talk about politics, what was going on in the world. Juan Jose is proud to show visitors around. After all, this is also his home. His mom, Pilar Del Rio, was married to Saramago for more than 20 years. This was Jose's study, where he wrote Blindness. The novel about a town quarantined after a mysterious epidemic was turned into a film by Brazilian director Fernando Mireles. This disturbing story about the ugliness of human nature is one of Saramago's best-known works. In the hard drive of this computer, we also found the sixth of the Lazarote notebooks. Nobody remembered it was here. It was the notebook that was written during the year he received the Nobel Prize. An olive tree welcomes visitors to Saramago's library. He built it in 2006 because his house couldn't hold his collection of more than 15,000 books. Even the tree is a story. Saramago brought it from Portugal as a memory of his childhood. Jose said he never imagined being able to make a living from literature. Him, a country boy of a humble family that only started writing books at the age of 60. In the late 1970s, Saramago interviewed peasants for his book Raised from the Ground. He realized his interviewees would never be able to read the piece, as they were illiterate. Social criticism has always been present in Saramago's works, but now the message was also in the way he wrote. That's when Jose starts to take out all the symbols, question marks, everything. He leaves only words. It's a way to show respect to the peasants. Jose described it as an oral style. The books were meant to be read out loud. After a long battle with leukemia, Saramago took his last breath in this very room. His reading glasses are still by the bed, and his legacy lives on in more than 30 books and this home. The saga will end. The story lives forever. As so they say about Star Wars, the rise of Skywalker. The final chapter in George Lucas's latest trilogy comes out on December the 20th. But if you're a big enough of a sci-fi geek, you don't have to wait until then. Since the first movie's release in 1977, Star Wars has become a franchise that's invaded our TV screens, movie theaters, Happy Meal boxes and billboards across the world. So, if that wasn't enough, Dolby Soho has dedicated an entire exhibit to Instagram-hungry fans who like the Force just a little bit too much. Right behind me here we have a virtual forest where you can see lightsabers. Um, all of the lightsaber duels from the entire saga of Star Wars are actually culminated here uh, where you can walk through the forest and hear all the sounds of lightsabers uh, in the Dolby Atmos format. 
The show is a mixture of 11 different exhibits with movie props, artworks, original production photos from the saga, and a 360-degree projection map featuring the movie trailer. I'm from Spain and we've come here just to see this. Uh, we have luckily been one of the first 100, so I don't know, I'm just excited to see what's here and to live this experience. I look for, forward to experiencing some, some heavy Star Wars. I've been a fan since 1977 when I was 13. I've seen all the movies and so uh, can't wait to be a part of it. But will the movie be any good? Well, if these fans are any indication, it won't matter. It might come as no surprise that one of 2019's most controversial artworks is found on French soil. Parisians have a reputation for losing their cool over new landmarks, especially if they are the ones paying for it. And Jeff Koons' recent installation in Paris's Petit Palais wasn't any different. Paris, the Eiffel Tower has been having a repaint. This great landmark is getting on in years, having been built for the exhibition of 1889. It takes the French a while to warm up to new things. The Eiffel Tower. In 1889, it was likened to a truly tragic street lamp. While architect I. M. Pei's Louvre pyramid sparked a satanic conspiracy theory and caused the Louvre's director to quit in protest. But French Portuguese artist Joana Vasconcelos wasn't phased in the faintest by her predecessor's misfortune. She constructed her Cour de Paris in Paris's 18th arrondissement. It too led to public outrage for both its price tag and its appearance. No surprise there. And if that wasn't enough to scare off all international artists from producing art on French soil, this year, Jeff Koons unveiled his bouquet of tulips in Paris's Petit Palais. And for many Parisians, Koons' work takes the prize for the city's most unfortunate artwork. The criticism started two years before the sculpture was even erected, sparking a trail of online petitions, nasty newspaper op-eds and fury over its funding coming from taxpayers' money despite it having been a gift from the artist to the city of Paris. You know, not uh, controversies aren't always nice. There was a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, people would write, uh, they had a misunderstanding of the scale of the piece. Uh, they had a misunderstanding. They thought that I chose the location. The former stockbroker turned pop sculptor has described the 12 meter tall bouquet as a symbol of solidarity, remembrance and healing following the 2015 Paris terror attacks. I was surprised by uh, uh, the controversy because it was, it was created by just creating an idea and that's the only attention. I gave this work three years of my life, a tremendous amount of attention. Well, if art doesn't elicit a response, why call it art in the first place? Although who knows, give the French a few years and maybe Queen's tulips will become just another Eiffel Tower. Salome Fancel, DRT World. We talk about video art all the time here on Showcase, but what exactly is it? Wikipedia, among other sources, say it's technology that creates moving images and audio to deliver a message. And I'm not sure about you, but to me, that sounds a bit vague. So we decided to track down the origins of this artistic medium and find out how it became such a phenomenon. Building bridges between nature and technology, past and present, the spectacle and the onlooker since the 60s. A retrospective exhibition on Korean-American artist Namjoon Pike shows his experimental and innovative video works that span over half a century. He was an interesting artist um, in terms of making any sort of unusual and unartistic medium into artistic realm. So for instance, when he first used TV as an artistic medium in 
1963, TVs were expensive electronic machines and it was never really meant to be artistic medium, but he thought that that could be used for his new art because he started in sound and music and he thought like experimental in sound and music, it can also happen with something like TV and video. His commentary and predictions about how society and technology would evolve in the future are laden in his installations. And for the most part, it's clear that he was pretty much spot on with his premonitions. However, he perceived our reliance on technology not as a wicked thing, but a new and hopeful way of communicating. Did he guess that right too? Are we more connected thanks to the little screens we carry around everywhere? J.D. Salinger led a reclusive life, but the public spotlight relentlessly tried to shine on him. His death put an end to that, but nine years later, the New York Public Library has been given permission to exhibit his personal effects. Among them, never-before-seen manuscripts, letters and photographs, all assembled exclusively from Salinger's personal archive. Let's take a look. One of America's most famous novelists, J.D. Salinger, author of Catcher in the Rye, is also known for being one of the most elusive. He really didn't want any fanfare around his work. He was a, a very humble person who kind of just wanted to disappear behind his work. This year, his son, Matt Salinger, and his literary estate reached out to the iconic New York Public Library to share his life with the public for the very first time. It was very clear from what J.D. Salinger told his family, and certainly there's one letter in this exhibition where Salinger talks about what should happen to an author's work after his death. He says that a hundred years should pass before an author's work is put before the public. So in that sense, we're 91 years ahead, given that it's only nine years since he passed away. The literary estate wanted not only to satisfy the curiosity of the public, but also address stories about Salinger that his family and trust believed to be misleading. They felt strongly that it was important for people to be able to see and hear Salinger in his own words. And I think you can do that through the letters that are in this exhibition. The collection includes photos from childhood, his time in World War II and later in life, handwritten manuscripts, correspondences with friends and personal belongings fill the space. What I wanted to present visitors with was a strong sense of Salinger as a writer and as a reader. Many visitors are drawn to Salinger because of the quality of his fiction, but they also want to get inside of his head. Next to many scripts and cover markups of Catcher and the Rye are books from Salinger's personal collection. These were kept on his bookshelf, just an arm's length away from his bed. Also in display is one of his oldest possessions, a small bowl he made at the age of 10 and kept with him throughout his life. One of the things that I found touching has nothing to do with writing. It gave me a sense of Salinger as a man. But his son told me that he would sometimes take a pipe and get a piece of burning coal or wood from the fireplace and drop it into the bowl and just sit and hold it because he liked the warmth of the, the, the feeling of the warmth of that wood in his hand. His journal entries and correspondences to friends like Ernest Hemingway and New York writers like William Sean and William Maxwell reveal his reflections on society and the world at the time. Through these notes and Salinger's belongings, the New York Public Library creates a portrait of a man, his relationships, values and a life lived, but rarely seen by the public. It's safe to say that no other ancient Greek myth has left a legacy as influential as the Trojan War. The epic, told and retold for generations, seems to have everything you want in a good story. A great war, revenge, love, despair, and of course, tragedy. 
But is this the reason why the 3,000-year-old myth is still relevant to this day? Showcase's Hatice Meryem Gelgör went in search of answers in a new London exhibition. This is the first time the British Museum is dedicating a show to the three-millennia-old epic of the Trojan War. With the title Myth and Reality. This is perhaps one of the reasons that makes the Trojan War so intriguing. We are still discussing whether it actually happened or not. The story, passed down most famously through Greek poet Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, features some of the most fascinating gods, goddesses and heroes of all time. But if you need to brush up on your mythology, here's a quick recap of the story. The three goddesses, Hera, Athene and Aphrodite, quarrel over a golden apple which is inscribed with the words for the most beautiful. Zeus, the king of the gods, doesn't want to, to judge in this quarrel, he doesn't want to upset any of the goddesses, so he asks the Trojan prince, Paris, to decide. Paris is having trouble deciding, so the goddesses bribe him, and Aphrodite offers him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world as her bribe. Well, this is Helen, and he can't resist. But Helen's already married to the Spartan king, the Greek king Menelaus. And Trojan Prince Paris steals Helen away from, from Menelaus, and that's what sparks this conflict. The Greek heroes, the Greek kings assemble, they assemble an enormous fleet, and they sail across the sea to the, the Trojan city, to, to Troy, um, to try and reclaim Helen for Menelaus. But Troy, of course, is a, is a great and well-fortified city. It's not as easy as they think, and they end up embroiled in this 10-year conflict. That's when the protagonist Achilles enters mortal combat with the Trojan prince Hector. One of the most illustrious of the Greek warriors, Achilles was invincible except for his famous heel. It's the climax of a conflict that leaves the reader without a clear sight to root for. It's not clear that there are good and bad sides in the Trojan War. I think that's what makes it a very adaptable archetype. So the Trojans are not the baddies and the Greeks the goodies. Actually, it's sad for both sides. The Greeks win the war, but they've destroyed a very sophisticated city and they themselves have a difficult time getting home. So there are no winners. In a way, both sides suffer. On display are various artefacts such as ancient pottery, silver vessels, bronze weapons and stone sculptures excavated from the site of Troy, located in the Turkish city of Çanakkale. The man who brought it all to light for the first time, Heinrich Schillemann, is however a bit of a controversy. Yes, he was the one to discover the site of Troy, which contributed greatly to the idea that the war was more than just a myth but he also smuggled all of his findings outside of Turkey. So Heinrich Schliemann was an extraordinarily interesting man, a very controversial character. He worked at Troy with Homer in one hand and a spade in the other. He really wanted to find the Troy of Homer, the Troy of the Trojan War. When he found treasures there, including what he called the treasure of Priam and the jewels of Helen, he behaved really very badly. He stole them away, he smuggled them from the site. The enduring epic has been the subject of many artworks throughout centuries, so the exhibition is not all about archaeology. Saito Omli's emotional rendering of the Vengeance of Achilles which represents a bloody spear tip and letter A for Achilles, hangs right next to a 2,500-year-old amphora. The poster of the 2004 film and contemporary graphic novels and manga are in the same hall as Rubens' depiction of the wrath of Achilles people still see themselves in the characters of the Trojan War. So they look at Achilles or Hector and think about heroism, the, the cost of being a hero, of being a combatant in the modern world. They look at Aeneas and Odysseus, the great travellers, and they think about journeys, forced migrations, journeys to find home again or to find a new home. These are themes that really still matter as much as they ever did. The women of the story are also given the recognition they deserve. After all, they make up half of the story. 
With all of its unique yet universal characters, this ancient tale of adventure, passion, rage and loss is alive and breathing in the halls of the British Museum, offering a glimpse into the never-changing human condition. Hatija Maryam Galgar, TRT World, London. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Thanks for watching. Bye for now.